Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a quick start with a few um, domestic points, a few announcements. Uh, you will see that this is being recorded. Um, so I need just to let you know that. That's the first thing I need to say. Um, but secondly, um, if you have, because it's being recorded and because it's a public event, uh, please just be careful on what you say. Don't disclose any information that you don't want to disclose in a public arena. I need to say that to start with. Um, but let me start by saying a very warm welcome to everybody with us. Great to have you with us. Um, we start with a title, and that is, Are International Investment Agreements Attracting Sustainable Foreign Direct Investment? That's a question. And we want to try and answer that question this afternoon. Very important question for me personally, having worked in international development my whole career, it's a really critical question. And I'm really looking forward to the answer. Um, I don't know the answer. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so with that in mind, let me introduce our speakers. Um, speakers, some of you will know already. Some of them are fairly well known. They've been in previous seminars. Um, let me start with Metka. Uh, Metka is a lecturer in law in our uh, law school in the University of Wolverhampton here. Um, her research interests focus on basically the critical investigation of intellectual property law through a feminist lens. Uh, very interesting area of work, and I've had some very interesting discussions um, with Metka. Um, I won't go into detail about all the things that she's done because that's all in the, the details. Um, I'll move on to Alessandro. He's a lecturer in economics here in Wolverhampton and has been for since September 2017. He was previously working as a teaching associate at Lancaster University and a teaching assistant at Kent University. So quite a range of universities he's worked in. His research focuses on the impact evaluation of public policies. And he's really interested in the analysis of local and regional development programs, as well as empirical methodologies applied in policy evaluation. So some pretty heavy stuff, you might think. Um, but I'm sure this afternoon we're going to see that in practice and what it actually means um, when it's actually applied. So looking forward to that. Uh, you son, some of you know from previous seminars. Um, I've been involved with her on previous seminars as well. Uh, she's a lecturer and she's leading a master's course in our international business in our business school. And her research interests are mainly in international business and management. Um, and she's working on a number of projects, including uh, this project and FDI impact and determinants. Um, but she's also working on lots of other projects. What's really interesting for me about this seminar this afternoon is that we're crossing borders. We're not just talking about law. We're not just talking about business. We're talking about international development, which is something I'm really interested in. Um, but we're talking in a sort of cross-disciplinary manner. So I'm really looking forward to introducing this session and hearing what we've got to say, because I really think that what makes these new FAB seminars different from any previous seminars is that now we're really working in an interdisciplinary manner. So I'm very excited to introduce our three speakers. Great also to have Pete Walton with us. Uh, Pete, many of you know, um, Pete's going to be saying, he's going to be fielding the questions, because um, probably he's the only one who can actually understand the questions when they come in. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit about the Law Research Center later in the day. But before, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who I think is Medka. So over to you, Medka. Thank you, Phil, for that very, very generous introduction. Uh, quite a tall order, right? You're expecting an answer to the question. Well, I, luckily, I am. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, I'll be just setting the scene. And while I'm sharing the screen, I think I'll just be sort of doing introductions. Um, and hopefully within a few seconds, it's also going to be properly. So can I just have notes from from that's good. Now that's okay. looking good. So we have the we have the um, title there and uh, the details. You will also see that both Anson and myself, we are on Twitter. So if you want to connect, you're welcome to. With Ale, you'll have to go the, the more traditional route and just fish out his email, which we do have at the end as well. So what are we doing today? Uh, we will be introducing the team. And of course, Phil has already generously done the introductions of what we do individually. 
but maybe when introducing the team, we'll be speaking around our research interest or how we came together. Because this is in, in its very true nature, we are an interdisciplinary team and two of us started and now it's three of us. So we'll be talking a little bit around that. And then we'll, we'll share with Anson, we're sharing sort of the context to the study. So how law and business were brought together. And then Anson and Ale will be together speaking about both research design and methodology. So we are proposing something new that we think hasn't been done previously. Um, and um, at the end, we'll also be sharing a little bit around the future direction of the project. So what is the team? Who are who, who is on the team? Why are we an interdisciplinary team? It is all about collaboration. And when we first started with exploring, it was me and Anson meeting each other at PG Cert and some of the other events as well. And we were just, you know, we liked each other and we, we were trying to figure out, is there an area we share that we could collaborate on? And I will go last in introducing myself. So I will give my, my, my I will now give way to, to both Ale and Anson to introduce their interests and, and what they do as researchers. And then I'll sort of take over again. Okay, should I say, okay, uh, Ale, do you wanna go first? Yeah, thank you very much, Matka, for uh, the introduction. And thank you all for inviting us to this uh, uh, research seminar. So basically, uh, okay, you know my name, I am Alessandro Cusimano, and um, I am lecturer in economics uh, at the Wolverhampton uh, Business School. I'm also part uh, uh, of the international business and uh, economics cluster. And uh, my research interests are mainly in the empirical methodologies that are applied in order to evaluate uh, public policy or public programs. So there is uh, all a set of uh, tools that are nowadays applied in order to evaluate the effectiveness of a program. And the idea we had in this team was to try and apply some of these methodologies to a field that is new. So to the best of our knowledge, it's the first time that these type of methodologies are applied to the study of the effect, in this case, of international investment agreements. So this is the reason why we created this team that is composed by members that have research interest that are not that close, uh, but our objective is to try and uh, put together, you know, different uh, pieces of uh, knowledge that we have uh, in order uh, to build, uh, hopefully, something uh, new and useful. Uh, this is uh, still uh, a work in progress because, uh, as we said, we are trying uh, to apply these new methodologies that uh, I'm going to present later uh, to a data set that we are uh, building uh, step by step, but uh, it is something we are going uh, to detail more during the presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. I think I can uh, leave the audience to Yunson. So thank you for your introduction, uh, Metka and Bill. And yeah, as Metka explained, uh, we met kind of as a team. Uh, partly because we liked each other, as Metka said, and also kind of we could see there are some kinds of areas where we need both disciplines or more than one discipline work together, such as FDI and legal uh, investment agreements. And also maybe some areas uh, we would need to explore new kinds of methodology to address certain issues. And that's again why, why I thought uh, international investment agreements can be understood or looked at from the angle of like a program or policy approach. And that's how we kind of contacted Alessandro, who is expert in that area. And then we tried to do these new things. Um, so let me just briefly uh, ex introduce myself as well. Um, I'm in the same uh, research cluster as Alessandro, uh, which is International Business and Economics, which is part of a management research center in business school. So there are three different uh, research clusters. Um, but yeah, Alessandro and I are in the International Business and Economics. 
Um, so my main research interest is in um, FDI, but as an outcome of FDI, there will be multinationals doing business in host countries and their impact um, and management issues will be relevant. So um, other project I'm doing is more about multinationals uh, sustainability management and also knowledge transfer between parent company and the uh, subsidiaries as well. Um, but I think Metika can explain a little bit more about how our team formed together when she's introducing herself about uh, her research interests and uh, areas. So I will leave it to you, Metika. Well, my, my fellow colleagues on the team are very shy, so I shall hopefully they will warm up a little bit more in, in the presentation. But yes, it's true that um, the nexus where we met, where our interests met first with Anson was foreign direct investment. So I started with foreign direct investment from a very, the study of that from a very unique perspective and that's within law, I'm a law researcher and I started doing research in that area during my PhD, which I did at Queen Mary in London. Now, I didn't do a traditional approach as you would normally find in business. So what I studied was intellectual property as investment assets in foreign direct investment. And you will see that when we come to setting up the context that it was intellectual property cases under these international investment agreements that were causing tension between investors trying to protect these investment assets and host states, so countries where the investment has been made, trying to protect, in my case, public health. So the cases I was studying were the tobacco cases, where you had countries starting with Australia introducing plain packaging legislation, which took away trademarks. So I was always very much aware that, yes, we have all these international investment agreement put in place. They are there to attract the investment, but they will come at a cost. So that was my research area. It was always within not only foreign direct investment, but what is the public interest within this area of regulation or within this sector? So I was aware that there is this conflict and tension of interests. And this is really what this study is about. It's testing the promise, the exchange that, yes, everyone is interested in pulling money in the foreign direct investment, but will it be worth it? So as a lawyer, when I was reading texts and you sort of go through literature review, we had these studies that say, sign on to these international agreements because it's worth it. You will attract foreign direct investment and that's the exchange. Yes, you're giving away some protection, but it will be, there will be a payoff, a trade-off. And that's why you see also the word sustainable in the title, because that's why we're interested not only in a one-off investment that will be the result of a new international agreement. What we're interested in, will that create a new environment that on long term will be beneficial to developing countries? So my journey into this team or why I could benefit is actually because not only do I, did I study the international framework that regulates foreign direct investment, I also was aware because of the case study, which was tobacco plane packaging of the frictions and tensions. And there have been con consequent uh, um, um, reforms that are proposed even in the legal framework that we currently see. So what did that mean? Back in 2018 already, I think we started the discussions. Then in 2019, our paper got accepted with Ansun. We went to Paris. Uh -huh. uh, we're, we're very happy with that. So we went to Paris and we'll share a link to the conference proceedings where our concept paper was also published. We'll share that in the chat once I jump out of all the windows I currently have open. And in that, we already sort of set out the, the legal bits and, and Anson will be speaking to some of the contextual bits. So that's set up there. But then the extra step was to introduce, to, to invite. So Anson was aware of Ale's work and she was able to say it would benefit our approach, which was already interdisciplinary to add on an additional methodology. So that's how the team came together. And we are having regular meetings where we meet every six weeks or so and we work together and we discuss how the data will be put together and we've already exchanged some conceptual papers as well and so forth and so forth we're all within the same university so that's been very helpful but we are 
from different disciplines. And I also fall within Law Research Center and Pete Walton will be telling us a little bit more. So Professor Walton will kindly uh, explore, expand on the Law Research Center and the work within there. Okay. So we're now coming to setting the scene. I've already mentioned my work around the tobacco cases and how that causes some of the friction, but now we'll invite Anson to start first before I jump to the legal bit to just tell us a little bit around the theoretical framework. What were we thinking in terms of the scope of this project? Anson, you want to take it over? Thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to kind of briefly explain about um, the relationship between FDI and uh, what kind of determine FDI. So a lot of uh, recent studies on FDI determinants, what actually attracts the FDIs, uh, have uh, kind of growing interest in non-economic vectors. So traditionally, you know, economic vectors such as GDP, which symbolize market size or, you know, actual kind of resources which multinationals are looking for. But um, I think especially since the developing countries are joining more and more in the global market after, you know, 1990s globalization intensified, um, kind of the conventional players, let's say, developed countries or developed countries, multinationals, kind of found these uh, in this uh, newly joining developing and transitional economies, the environment is very different. So one of uh, IB scholars have put that as, you know, in conventional developed countries, the background institutions such as legal framework or political uh, environment, they are all background kind of setting. But in many developing countries and transition economies, those factors are actually very significant factors which can have impact on determinants of FDI. So either it can be positively or it can be negatively. And in many cases, um, institutional constraints or poor uh, kind of institutional environment plays as negative um, kind of elements in uh, attracting FDI. But at the same time, I think Phil uh, might be familiar with this concept. Um, once this globalization has intensified since 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed, the globalization has been very much led by neoliberal kind of idea, ideology and the policy um, agenda from particularly international institutions such as IMF or World Bank. And these uh, institutions were kind of emphasizing the benefit of FDI in many developing countries, um, partly because developing countries are lack of financial market capital uh, resources, and therefore um, UNCTA, the UN Conference and Trade and Development, uh, I quoted here, even said this FDI will work as engine of development. So many developing kind of uh, countries either you know driven by this academic research or you know uh, kind of policy makers agenda saying fdi will be beneficial for you and therefore you have to work on attracting um fdi but at the same time from multinationals investors perspective they are afraid of uh, you know the legal risks or political risks or institution risks in these countries and here i think um the international investment agreement have some kind of significance in FDI studies. So problematical will explain in more detail from legal framework, but uh, in that angle, from that angle, uh, many FDI studies kind of started including institutional factors and part of it, some of the FDI studies, particularly determinant studies, were looking into whether there is any impact from this international investment agreement on attracting uh, FDI. So uh, that's kind of a, a brief background of how kind of the re research question of our project started. And then now I will uh, hand over to Metka to explain the actual in international investment agreements from legal framework. Thank you, Ansan. And hopefully I'll be able to do that succinctly and not uh, take it too, too much into detail. So, uh, what we have is international investment agreements are, this is not an area of law that students would study in their undergraduate degree, not in their first year, not in their second year, not in their third year. They might have some kind of an international business course or maybe international trade course. And then depending on the expertise of their lecture, they might hear of something that's called investment law. 
often we see these areas being studied on master level or then maybe uh, in some specialized, uh, whether it's PhD programs or specialized institutions. But this is not something that's commonly known, even among lawyers. And traditionally, so whereas from the 1960s onwards, we had a rise in numbers from something that's called a bilateral investment treaty, a BIT. So that is an agreement between two countries, country A, country B, that promise, give each other a promise in the form of an international agreement, a treaty, if you will, um, that they will give a certain level of protection to each other's investors. So country A will say, all investors from country B come and invest in our country. And if anything goes wrong, you'll be given protection. That protection will be against taking of property or unfair treatment and so forth and so forth. Now, these treaties up until 90s didn't really cause any cases. So that was a dormant issue. There wasn't much fuss going around this. But if you look at the number of treaties, and I have been revising the numbers before the presentation, so we've even seen the change in numbers since 2019 when we first did the study. We have over, so we have 2,852 bilateral investment treaties signed. That's not a, a small number. So it is something that you would think of being quite, quite important in, in the legal framework. But again, it's not that well known and 2,298 being in force. So they're actually, they have a legal uh, force. They're legally binding. Um, and in addition to the bilateral treaties, we now also have the uh, treaties with investment protection. So these are the regional agreements. So a bilateral agreement is between two countries. That's why it says bilateral. And then we have regional agreements where you have more than two countries um, signing onto this. Now, all of this has been changing since the 1990s, where with the NAFTA agreement, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, Canada and the US, we've seen a rise of cases. So investors became very, very savvy in this area, and they were able, they were starting to invoke these legal types of protection to get compensation when things didn't go their way in a particular country. And of course, especially with developing countries, and a big multinational foreign investor, the equality of power was not always equal. So we've seen a rise of cases since the 1990s. And then what we also see is that we have a rise in cases, and that's after 2000, cases that not only affect the individual contract and the individual investor, but more and more start to affect the public interest of the state where the investment has taken place. So there's more tension and there's more pressure on that promise actually being true. So if we're giving foreign investors these additional protections that domestic investors, domestic companies do not have that level of protection, then again, it has to be worth it. Well, is it? <laughs> and then we have, you know, Anson nicely already laying out that what will determine the flow, inflow of foreign direct investment is a complex issue. But one of the proposition was that if you sign on to these international treaties, that is a positive factor. And of course, the interest is to test that. And you see the numbers in front of you, so I'm not going to be saying it. But if I tell you that in the 1990s, we had but a fraction of cases. And now every year you have 60, 70 new cases adding on. And these cases go into millions and millions and sometimes even more in terms of the quantities of being tried. Now, the problem that then came about was not only the, the increase in the number of cases, but the types of cases now started to encroach on something that would traditionally be considered to be within the domain of a state. How much protection will you give in, in a health sector you know, that should be reserved for the sovereign state. Is it really on the foreign investor to start interfering with policy such as tobacco advertising, which is the case we saw Philip Morris and Uruguay and Philip Morris and Australia. They were trying to affect that legislation. Actually, the investor they, there was less interested in getting money as a conversation. 
what they do is they use the threat of this case being brought to an international forum to try and stop the change in the legal framework. So that's one tobacco dispute. Then you have different kind of patent disputes where we saw that in a case of Canada, where it had to do with access to patent protection, patents being protection for technical inventions, technical solutions for technical problems. And you can imagine that how that is being sorted could affect very, very important issues. Think about vaccines, COVID-19, and everything we're looking at now. Do we really want foreign investors to play any role in this discussion? And then, of course, cases like the Vattenfall case with Germany, that was a case where Germany decided a few years ago to close down all of its nuclear power plants. The, this sort of it was a policy decision, and the investor Vattenfall said, "Hey, hey, you know, this is an investment we were planning to have returns on for many, many decades to come." And in the end, Germany had to pay investment investor the damages and and so forth. So these are issues that have very, very important consequences, sometimes also on matters that will be of public interest. So these are not just private disputes. This is not just a contract for a purchase of, I don't know, a thousand hospital beds. These are big cases, they're very important. And you can imagine that when the defendant is not Germany, Canada or Australia, so developed strong countries, if you have a developing country with limited resources, the pressure is different. And then, you know, when you have systems that are sort of uh, not stable, as we see now with, with economies all over the world, with COVID-19 negatively affecting business environments across the world, Brexit has caused disruption to legitimate expectations of investors here. So, you know, this is an ongoing issue. And again, this will bring us now, I will hand over to the economist on the team. This brings us to how do we make sure that that promise of sign on to this additional protection, you'll get the investors in, but it's worth it. Yes, there's a price, but it's worth it. Is it? Okay. With this, I am now handing over to both Anson, who will take over first, and then Ale to, to continue as well. But that's me done for, for the legal side of things. Okay, so can we, uh, yes. Um, so um, a lot of kind of studies started looking at um, how that can be linked, the international investment agreements can be linked to FDI. So as um, I briefly mentioned, and also as Matika explained, the kind of rationale behind um, the in, in, international investment agreements can be helpful or positive to attracting FDI was, particularly in developing countries or transition economies where the institutional difference that environments are different and therefore considered as kind of poor and uh, constraints to investors. If those countries host uh, government kind of showing signal to investors, look, I have agreed this international investment agreement, which can kind of work as substitute for poor institutional environment to protect your investment. And therefore you will probably more likely to invest in our country compared to countries which do not have that kind of agreements or agreed um, in the FDI policy case. Um, so it, uh, one of the kinds of uh, findings from previous empirical studies supporting this rationale is there are uh, definitely kind of a trend which the, the studies looked at ratified uh, bilateral international treaties has got much more significant outcome than uh, just looked at signed um, bilateral in investment <laughs> treaties. That kind of uh, a little bit showing the rationale might work as, you know, this AIIA work as kind of substitute for poor institutions. But overall, previous empirical studies didn't really have agreed um, kind of outcomes or findings uh, at the best, you know, mixed outcomes all the time. So sometimes they find it doesn't have any uh, Im implications. Some has got positive, some has got even like negative um, results. And, you know, many cases just they can't define anything because it's statistically insignificant. And um, so 
what uh yeah thank you Imetka. so what uh i Metka and i thought was okay um there are certainly determinants uh which are uh, traditionally economic ones, which have been uh, testified very well. And recently, especially with the developing countries uh, cases, there has been some studies which tested and also proved institutional factors such as law, political uh, environment have impact on inward FDI. But having IIA as determinant factor might not work. Maybe IIA's role is not as a kind of determinant factor, but maybe it contribute or having negative impact, whatever it is, it has got impact or it plays certain role in the process of these other factors affecting um, the FDI. And there we thought maybe we can see this AIA, <laughs> IIA as like a policy or kind of program, this host country government are trying to do to either fasten or you know kind of making that uh, process uh, better in terms of attracting FDI. That's how we came to Alessandro, and then we asked him whether he thinks that's kind of viable. And Alessandro get got back to us with a really positive note, and he has been working on the methodology part. So I will leave, leave, uh, leave it to Alessandro to explain more about the methodology. Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to give a very brief introduction of what uh, uh, the methodologies on uh, program evaluation uh, try to do and why we think that uh, it's possible to apply this kind of methodologies to our study. So the idea of uh, evaluating uh, a program is in theory very easy, but it's quite difficult to implement because our objective is to take the recipient of a program and compare in terms of, uh, of some outcome measure the value assumed by the outcome measure of uh, the person that is uh, recipient of the, of the program with uh, the outcome that uh, the same individual would have achieved in absence of the program. So to give a very simple example, if we consider a student that, uh, I don't know, receives some uh, extra uh, classes and we want to see the effect of these extra classes on uh, the mark achieved in a given module, what we can do, we should compare the result, the grade that the student achieves in case he participates to these extra classes with the grade that the same student would have achieved without participating to the class. So in theory, it's very simple. In practice, it's something that cannot be done because either we observe the grade if the student takes part in these extra classes, or we observe the grade of the student in case he does not take part in these extra classes. So we can never observe the same student and the two outcome measures. So this is the reason why usually the classical methodologies for program evaluation basically uh, look at uh, a binary distinctions between uh, treated and uh, untreated individuals. So recipients of a program and people who did not uh, um, take part in, in the program. Uh, we can go to the previous slide, sorry. Okay, yeah, <laughs> this was just uh, a very brief introduction, sorry. Uh, so the general idea is, okay, what we do? We have what we call uh, a missing state of the world. So either we observe, uh, the subject as uh, being treated, or we observe the subject as uh, being uh, untreated, and we want to create uh, a proxy for the missing state of the world. This is what uh, the classical methodologies for uh, program evaluation aim to do. So for people that, uh, uh, I don't know, already did some of these, uh, applied these methodologies to, uh, um, to some of their studies, uh, uh, what we find usually are uh, the methodologies uh, that are based on uh, propensity score matching methods in which we create uh, the missing state of the world uh, and so on. Why I'm trying to give this introduction? Because uh, in the last few years, uh, we observed many new uh, methodologies, many new attempts made by literature in order to extend this division between recipients and not recipients of a program in case in which 
we have different kind of treatments. So the methodologies that we are applying is the one that is proposed by Catania and Drucker. is a very new methodology. So just to give you the reference, uh, the paper that uh, uh, has been published on Theta Journal in 2013 is named Estimation of Multivalued Treatment Effects Under Conditional Independence. And uh, why do we want to apply this methodology? Because our objective is uh, to quantify uh, the effect of these different types of treatment. In our case, uh, the treatment is given by the different types of uh, international investment agreements on some outcome measure that we are going to observe. In our case, the outcome measure will be given by the FDI inflow. So, um, similar to, similarly to what uh, I was saying in the case of the binary uh, treatment, our main difficulty is that uh, what we have is a missing data problem. Why? We are focusing on a set of development countries, and of course, by nature, for each country, we are able to observe the value that is assumed by the outcome measure only for one out of the different treatment levels. So the idea is if we have different types of treatments that in our case are given by the different types of international investment agreements, we can observe the outcome measure for country A only for one out of the different treatment levels. Uh, if we move to the uh, next uh, slide, what we do in order to apply the methodology? We estimate what are called the means and quantiles of the potential outcome distributions. So the potential out outcome distributions are defined as uh, the distribution that uh, the outcome variable would have uh, under each level of treatment. Again, we are trying uh, to build uh, some proxy for the missing state of the world. So it's a methodology that, uh, similarly to other methodologies uh, that are uh, applied in program evaluations, uh, are uh, based on uh, the concept of uh, selection on observables, or uh, more technically, on uh, the assumption of uh, unconfoundedness that basically states that after we control for some covariates that we can observe, the potential outcome distributions that we are going to estimate are independent of the treatment level. So basically, the assumption rules out that some observable factor cor correlated with the treatment assignment affect the potential outcome distributions. Uh, we can again move to Next slide, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Okay, so what are the practical steps uh, of our methodology? I repeat, we are, this is still uh, a work in progress, so we are at uh, this stage uh, building the data set and trying to run uh, the first uh, uh, regressions. We start by defining uh, the discrete treatments. So as I said, this methodology can be applied in our case because uh, we can assume that our different types of uh, international investment agreements can be seen as different discrete treatments. Then we define a set of uh, covariates that basically represent uh, the specific characteristics of the countries that we are considering. Then uh, step three is a bit more technical, but just uh, to give you an intuition, we want uh, to specify a model for what is called uh, the generalized propensity score. And uh, we want to specify a model for the conditional mean. Now, this methodology that I said is based on the uh, Theta Journal, so is implemented through a Theta routine, basically uses uh, different information criteria. So in detail, what we use are the Bayesian information criterion and the Kaiki information criterion. And these two information criteria, uh, what we do is to select the model that minimizes these two information criteria from a set of candidate models. 
Once we specify these models, both for uh, the GPS and uh, the conditional mean, we estimate the means of the potential outcome distribution for each value of the treatment. Okay, so the idea is that we will see in one moment we have uh, these different types of uh, international investment agreements. For each type of uh, international investment agreement, uh, we are able to estimate the means of the potential outcome distributions and to contrast the results among the different levels of treatment. And then once we have the analysis for the means, we can move to the quantile analysis. So what we do is to compare the 0 0.25, 0 0.50, and 0 0.75 quantiles of the potential outcome distributions for each level of treatment. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we have uh, some possible treatments that we are trying uh, to define. So as you can see, this is what I mean when I say that uh, we try to define the possible treatments by looking uh, at uh, the characteristics of uh, the international investment agreement. So for example, as you can say, one, uh, so treatment one gives us uh, what uh, can be one uh, of our discrete treatments. So we have uh, four values. We have uh, baseline that is uh, no international investment agreement signed. And then we have uh, one, two, and three, three different levels of the is a discrete treatment that is a low number, medium number, and larger number of uh, international investment agreements that are signed. And this can be done for different characteristics. So say that we are trying to define a different level, different kind of treatments in order to see uh, how the different kind of treatments will have an impact on our outcome measure. So for example, uh, we have, uh, uh, if we go one moment back, we are having treatment two that was uh, given by international investment agreements that were in force and again, low, medium, and large. Treatment three, we look at uh, international protection where we have uh, the baseline as uh, no international protection and then uh, international bilateral and regional and then we have again treatment four and five that are given by other characteristics of our uh, in international investment agreement okay so it is just to show that we are trying to define different kinds of treatments and to see how these uh, sorry, different uh, types of uh, international investment agreements and how this can be translated into discrete treatments in order to apply this uh, uh, methodology. Uh, once we define the treatment, uh, the next step uh, are given by the identification of the outcome measure. As I said, uh, we are looking right now at the inward FDI flows per capita. So we want to see what is the impact of uh, uh, each uh, type of treatment on uh, inwards FDI flows. We have already selected uh, a list of covariates to be included. So right now we are working on uh, exports and uh, import measures, primary and uh, uh, industry sector as a percentage of GDP, some unemployment measures, GDP per capita, political constraints index, economic freedom index, primary, education completion rate, so different uh, covariates that uh, basically we are using in order to match uh, the characteristics uh, of uh, our countries before uh, we look uh, at uh, the treatment. Um, in, before was explaining how we are, uh, merge, we are creating this data set by merging data from different uh, sources, so we have most of the data collected from UNCTAG stat, then we have some additional data that are taken by World Bank, World Bank. Um, we have a heritage center, and so on. And we are looking, so our sample is given by uh, developing countries according to the definition that we find on UNCTAG stat. Um, Next steps, as I said, is a, is a work in progress. So we have to see what we obtain by the different types of treatment we are looking at. There are, of course, some challenges. So, of course, 
when we apply this kind of methodologies, there is a trade-off between the number of covariates that are included and the number of observations we can use in our study. Why? Because, of course, the more we add covariates and the more we have uh, uh, we improve basically the quality of the matching, so the quality of our analysis, but on the other side, the more we add covariates and uh, the more we reduce the number of observations, so in our case, the number of countries that can be included. And the same thing is for the length of the time period that we can include. So we are also um, you know, uh, working a little bit with, with data in order to reach an acceptable trade-off in which we have a good quality of covariates included and a good length of the time period that is included without uh, having to lose uh, too many observations. Uh, I think I leave, yeah, this uh, last slide to Jensen. Me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, still the research is uh, ongoing, and um, particularly Alessandra is really working on how to kind of uh, address the challenges in methodological application. Um, but we believe our uh, study can have good implications in you know, FDI study and also IIA study, and maybe a more wider context such as development study. Um, first of all, we might kind of have fresh insight about the role of IIAs, and Metka was explaining about the potential you know, benefit and cost of this IIA and whether it is always kind of the positive thing which especially developing countries should pursue. If we know more details about uh, the role IIA is playing in FDI attraction, we will have more kind of um, bigger picture about uh, making implication to those um, countries. So previously IA was kind of part of one of the determinants, but if we are op uh, applying this kind of new methodology, we will know about more kind of uh, complex role of the IIA. And also what we are hoping for is not just about the role of IIA attracting FDI, as Metka said, and also uh, part of my study is about what's the outcome of the FDI when multinationals are, are actually doing business in uh, those kinds of host countries. And so we kind of are hoping our study can lead to uh, looking into IIA's role, not just in attracting FDI, but retaining. And in that retaining means not just the kind of making that FDI staying in the host country, but also what can be that implication when this FDI coming in and then doing business, whether that is actually really um, beneficial for host countries or whether there can be kind of additional uh, cost which were not reflected in uh, initial agreements. So that is kind of our uh, kind of hope and what we think we can contribute. So thank you for listening. <laughs> and yeah, if you've got any questions, please uh, put that in q and I think, the chat box. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much um, um, for all of that, everybody. That was very enjoyable. And um, no normally we would be um, deafened by um, the, the, the sound of applause as it would be ringing out. So uh, thank you very much for, for that run through of your project. That was very enjo enjoyable and very interesting stuff. So um, I'll just give people um, a moment or two to, to think about some questions. So if you have got any questions, do uh, uh, put them in the, uh, the question and answer box and, uh, and we can put them to our um, esteemed panelists. Um, I, I should just say um, something really just, just to echo what Phil said at the beginning, really, that um, the, the university itself um, is structured in a way um, to, to, to encourage research. And, and, and historically, there are parts in the university which are research institutes, um, and, and they've historically been interdisciplinary in nature, not all of them, but essentially that's, that's, their, that's their sort of raison d'etre, as it were. Um, and research centres such as the Law Research Centre and the Management Research Centre have been more subject specific. So in law, um, historically, we've been pretty much law based. So, and, and it's very much the case that we're, we're specialists in certain areas of law. So Mecca is an expert in a number of areas, but, but intellectual property being her sort of primary 
uh, area of expertise. I need to be careful what I say there because she's an expert in lots of areas. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a um, single issue fanatic in terms of insolvency law and, and other colleagues have got their other um, subjects, uh, 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 areas of specialism such as financial services law, the law of evidence, um, criminal justice and, and, and so on. So, so we have a, a wide array of subject specialisms um, and, and we try and encourage research at all levels. So we, we try and encourage early career researchers, PhD students to come through and to become um, academics as well as encouraging uh, people such as myself who've been um, doing this sort of thing for sort of 30 odd years and so so we've got a wide array of experience and and and, and uh, a wider way a, a, a wide array of people at different stages of their research and we, and we try and do empirical work work it's interesting to hear Alessandro talk about that um, we try and do doctrinal work we try and do work which has an impact on society generally and, and so um, um, one of the things we're trying to do, and one of the things which is today is are such a good example of, is, is look at doing interdisciplinary work. And I, and I, and I genuinely think that, that that's where a big chunk of the future lies for academic research. So we can't just be in our silos anymore. We're absolutely determined to uh, uh, move into more interdisciplinary work. And I've done some interdisciplinary work and, and uh, I had to work with a statistician a few years ago. And I still have no idea quite what, what he was doing, um, but he was working magic with the data that we produced. So, um, so well done to him for, for making sense of what we were up to. Um, and and, and um, if anybody's um, watching today's class and they're, and, and they're thinking, gosh, it'd be interesting to have a go at doing a PhD in, in one of these areas, do, do please get in touch. Um, we're always very keen to encourage the next generation of, of, of academics through. So um, um, there's a bit of action in the chat box I can see, um, but I've, I've got a question for, for, for uh, I think for all of you really, um, and, and from my experience of doing inter interdisciplinary work, um, I just wonder how you would react to this question. So um, one of the things that, that, that made me nervous about interdisciplinary work was um, that I might um, struggle to explain what my expertise was and what I sort of brought to the table. And I would struggle to understand what on earth my colleagues were doing who, who weren't lawyers. And, and although I always think whatever the project is, there's a place for a lawyer. Um, not everybody would necessarily agree with that. Um, um, but, but, but uh, you know, um, am I, can an economist make uh, his or her specialism accessible to a lawyer and vice versa and, and, and kind of how have you dealt with that really? That's to all of you, who wants to go first? Come on boss lady, you're, you're first. <laughs> um, so I think it, I was a little bit in the middle. I had a little bit of understanding of the uh, legal agreements, not as a legal framework, but I knew that has got really a great impact on FDI. And I did a little bit of quantitative uh, study for my PhD. So I understood a little bit of a quantitative and statistics um, areas. So, I mean, I should have played a much better role in <laughs> bridging uh, these two different disciplines. Um, but I think, as you said, the one of the, and, and I think I mentioned in another interdisciplinary seminar, one of the uh, important steps for interdisciplinary study is to trying to understand each other's uh, language. And I, I was really uh, impressed when Metka kind of tried to understand the like, statistical kind of terminologies. Beginning, she said, you should kind of uh, use different terms, but later on, I could see she's using some of these uh, statistical languages that was really encouraging and similarly you know I'll uh, keep kind of asking what is the, the uh, acronym stand for uh, in terms of legal agreements and etc so trying to understand each other's languages I think uh, one of the important steps that's my answer uh, thank you for that uh, any any other offers come on Ale Okay. Yeah. yeah if I got something I think we reached a good we reached a good uh, compromise between uh, uh, having each of us the uh, specific task, but at the same time uh, trying to have a teamwork. So at the end, uh, our objective as a researcher is the one to disseminate knowledge. So what is important is not to have, you know, an analysis that is uh, uh, too advanced or uh, in terms of law, something too difficult to understand, but it's important to share uh, the piece of knowledge that uh, can be understood by uh, as many people as possible. So this is what we try to do in our team, uh, trying to simplify the information from what we have in terms of our uh, uh, you know, expertise area to something that can be uh, easily exchanged, easily uh, communicated and so on. And this is what we are trying to do, hopefully. Mm. I would also say there are issues of confidence and trust. So confidence in terms of 
you um, having confidence in your own expertise so you know what you're doing. Uh, so then, because you will be questioned by your colleagues from a different discipline, from all sorts of angles, just like a student would really, they will question every single assumption and, and make statements that will say, oh, nobody ever asks such a question in law. Well, they will because they're not from the area. So I think confidence uh, as a researcher and also trust. So the only way I can really know whether Ale is doing his job in a way that, you know, an expert in his field would do is to trust him. And the same with Ansun, to trust her. So it's not easy to work in, in an interdisciplinary uh, team without those elements. So that's sort of, but I would agree with, with everything that my friends have said so far, so yes. Um, thank you for that. Um, now we've, we've got some questions um, coming in the Q&A box and in the chat box. Philip, have we got time for a, an, another question before you wrap up or do you need to jump in and wrap us up? Um, you're on mute, Phil. Please go ahead, let's have a few questions. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I rarely get to say that to anybody else. I'm usually on the receiving end of that one. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so our first question um, in, in the in the Q and A box is: uh, Thanks for the thorough explanation of the methodology. I probably did not get your conclusion with regards to whether there are correlations between the treatments tested and what sustainable FDIs have been observed. Um, so I don't know if that's for Anderson uh, or for Alessandro. I, I don't know if you can uh, give a succinct answer to that one. Yeah, I, I can quickly and honestly answer that this is a stage of the work we didn't reach yet. So. Uh, the, the reason why there were not conclusions is that is because we didn't reach yet any conclusion. So as soon as we have uh, some uh, results, uh, let's see if we can also see it with a working paper or something like that. Great. Um, good economist answer there. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, essentially. I'll, I'll figure it out later on. Um, so that's can very I just Can I just interject that um, as much as uh, Ale made it sound as if we're not there, we did try already different permutations of treatments. And it actually didn't bear the results that we could work with. So even setting out the treatments, it, it's quite a, an expert process. So what will actually work for us to have substantial or what is it, statistically relevant results? It is still, a, it's part of the research process. So we've been working on this since last August, already specifically on the treatments, pulling together data and everything. So um, even though Ale was very modest, uh, I think it, that's why we don't have more to share today. So it's still- um, There's a work in progress, but it's very much um, in progress. Yeah. Um, and then we've just maybe just got time for, um, Elizabeth um, um, put, a, put a question in the chat about, um, uh, specifically about Nigeria, but more widely about African governments and whether or not they need to review the performance of their um, BITs um, to, to reconfigure their approaches to them. Uh, so I don't know if that's a, a legal question or, or, or an economist question. Well, the only thing I can say before Anson can maybe jump from the business angle is that there were some cases that were sort of where um, African countries were on the receiving end of an investment claim and it didn't always go great for, for the country involved, but um, it, it's hardly um, uh, an issue specific, specifically aimed at, let's say, Nigeria. So it, it would be developing countries more broadly. That, that were affected. And BITs in general have been very, viewed very, very skeptically. And that's why we have all the reform projects because of the BITs themselves. But that's, that's the legal side, yeah. Great, and um, I think that probably answers uh, Elizabeth's question. Sorry, and so I've talked over you. Do you want to just come in there? I, I just do wanted to mention briefly about our research. And uh, that's why, again, we wanted to look at the uh, IIA from a little bit a different angle so that we can include other elements, not just bilateral, but what about compared to regional or what about the number of, you know, the countries involved in the international investment agreement in total. So whether it is bilateral or regional, etc. So that's what we are hoping for, kind of providing more complex kind of picture of these relations between IIA and uh, FDI. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think we're, um, time is defeating us, which is a shame. I think we've probably got another um, half an hour of this, but um, Phil, I'll hand it over to you to, to wrap up. It's always good to leave people wanting more, isn't it? 
It is, and thanks very much for taking the questions, Pete. Good to have you with us. Um, can I just say a big thanks to all three speakers for a really interesting presentation. I'm, I didn't get an answer to my question. Uh, you didn't answer the question that you put up yourselves, um, but work in progress. So look forward to, look forward to hearing more. Um, sounds, sounds like a really interesting sort of analysis that you're, you're doing and I, you know, good luck with it. Thanks also for sharing the, some of the issues around interdisciplinary research, because we've had discussions on this before and I think it's a really interesting discussion. And I would really welcome suggestions as what we need to do to get more interdisciplinary research, because as a faculty or as a university, not just a faculty, as a university, we've got huge potential for interdisciplinary research. And this is where the exciting breakthroughs, I think, in research are really going to be in the future. So I think we really need to sort of look at that in detail if we can, um, perhaps in future seminars, as well as sort of, you know, things like trust, I think are really, really important. And how do we build that trust? Um, how did you get together in the first place? Was it just a chance meeting? You, you said that you were on the... Um... Yeah. In, in fact, it was. We saw each other a few times and we started to recognize faces. More or less, we were both very early on with Anson. And then we just had a cup of coffee. Yeah, so it was purely random chance. Nothing institutional that would bring us research-wise together. So it was more yeah. a happy coincidence, I would say. I think there's some really important lessons, really interesting points coming out of that. Thanks for sharing that, Metka. And as I say, just the reason I'm saying that is that one of the one of the features of the this Fab series, as opposed to into, as opposed to sort of subject specific series of seminars, is that we are trying to feature with these seminars interdisciplinary research. Um, so a huge thanks to the three of you, and thanks again to Pete. Um, I must just say something about the next two seminars. Um, get a plug in for them now. Um, the next one is on the 9th of June. Um, it's a midday one between one and two o'clock and it's called Exploration in Arts, Science and Technology, the Identifying Successful Starts Methodologies Project. And this is a project that's been led by a colleague, Denise Doyle, um, who's really, really interesting. The work that she's been doing is, is absolutely fascinating. So would really recommend that one. And then the following one on the 17th of June um, is by Matt Dalglish in our um, Performing Arts Department. And that's called Expanding Interaction, Music and Audiovisual Interfaces Beyond Instruments. Something well, something really to look forward to there. Um, got, got you all puzzled, I suspect. So can I just finish by saying a big thanks to all three of you. Thanks again, Pete, as well. Um, really good to have you with us and thanks for a really, really interesting seminar that you've given us. And good luck with the research in the future. Look forward to hearing the, result, the results as and when. So a big clap to everybody. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.